Mary from Stanford University will speak about the uh, complexity of the Sorinter Kirkpatrick uh, model. Okay, thanks to everybody. Uh, let's see if it works. Oh, this is. What is this? Um, yeah, so before starting, this is joint work with uh, Cho Fan, who is, uh, was a former student of mine, now a faculty in Yale, and Song Mei, who is an applied math student in Stanford, uh, both fantastic uh, collaborators. Uh, so, of course, I should start by reminding where, when I first met Giorgio. I remember when I first met him physically, but perhaps most important to me is when I first met him intellectually. And I remember at the end of second year, be beginning of third year undergraduate, I read Feynman Hibbs' book on path integral and quantum mechanics. And after I finished, a, a you know, friend of mine, a couple of years ahead of me, Leonardo Rastelli, who is now a string theorist, told me, hi, you, you know about path integral, you should read uh, Statistical Field Theory by Giorgio Parisi. Uh, so I, I bought the book and still have it. Is this one is uh, on my desk, and I started reading, and I read the first four chapters, and that was fine. And then I arrived at around chapter five or six, I don't know which one was, and there was a phase transition. All of a sudden, I didn't understand anything, and my reaction was something like, "Wow, that's so cool! I don't understand anything." <laughs> and and this, I think, conveys a little bit of uh, you know. You know, what attracts us also to Giorgio's ideas, there is, of course, they are interesting, etc., but they are always a bit mysterious, and this is always fascinating. Okay? So this is the plan of the talk. Uh, uh, I, I spent quite some time talking about uh, motivation that comes from a problem in machine learning that is called topic models. I think it's a good motivation, it's a real problem, and it would be good if this community got interested into it, and then discuss a simple model that, of course, is a spin glass model, and, of course, free energy, and uh, show how complexity of the scheme model play, uh, a crucial, plays a crucial role in, in the proof that we have. And this is a bit technical, and not everybody might be interested in this topic, so I'll give you a little calculus exercise that you can do without pen and paper if you want, and uh, uh, so you can uh, not get completely bored, and calculus exercise is the following. Take two cylinders of equal diameter, intersect them you know, uh, perpendicularly, orthogonally, you get an intersection that has this shape, and compute the volume of this intersection. It's quite easy. What is a bit harder is to figure out what is the connection with Giorgio. And at the end of the talk, I'll, I'll explain you the connection. OK, so what are topic models? Uh, topic models are models for this kind of data. You have documents. And uh, we'll think of documents as vectors in a high-dimensional space, so d-dimensional vectors. And when I say document, you can think, for instance, of all the articles published in physical review letters on the last 25 years. Each of these articles is a document, and somehow you have a scheme to encode it a, as a vector. The normal scheme, the simplest scheme is, for instance, uh, word counts. And what you want to do, you have all of these you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of vectors, and you want to identify topics. Okay? So you want to identify, without anybody annotating this document by hand, the fact that inside these articles there is uh, I know, some statistical physics, some, some high energy physics, perhaps some biological physics, and so on. And the way people think about this, or the uh, you know, uh, uh, main way people think about this is the following. You think of topics also ve as vectors in the same space, but of course there is far fewer topics than documents. So the number of topics is k, but while the number of documents is n, so this is much smaller. And then what you think of is that you, each document, you want to express it as a, a mixture of topics. So each of the vectors, xi, you want to write it as a combination of these vectors, uh, h tilde 1 to h tilde k, 
And what I mean by a mixture, I mean a convex combination. This is the dominant thing. So you write xi as a sum over j of wrjh tilde j, where the wrj are weight vectors. So they are non negative, and summed over j, they add up to 1. And this is just a figure stolen from, from a review papers by David Bly that is kind of uh, the, leading world ex the world leading expert on this topic, the topic of topic models. <laughs> and uh, here it gives you an application in which it takes uh, well, uh, an article, perhaps a biology article, and it show by running his methods, his algorithm, it can decompose uh, you know, the sequence of words as words that come from different topics. So here in this example, he has perhaps, uh, you know, a few topics. I don't know which one they are. The first one contains uh, uh, genetic, etc. The second one, life, blah, blah, blah. The third, the brain, etc. And so he writes his document as a convex, convex combination with these weights of these three topics, and then he associates each word to each of one of the topics. So this is perhaps an article that is a little bit of genetics, a little bit of biology, and uh, no, no neuroscience. Right? And you can think of do this for your favorite corpus of documents. And this is, of course, very useful because it allows you to kind of organize large collection of data that don't have any organization a priori. So in matrix notation, what you are doing is the following. You can think of stacking all of these documents as rows of a big matrix, and all of these columns have, as columns of a big matrix. And you are trying to write you know, the matrix of all documents as a weight matrix times the matrix of topics plus some noise. Okay? So now noise shouldn't be interpreted really literally as a stochastic noise, but it's whatever it's not explained by, by the by the low rank model. Okay? And, and there is a nice geometric intuition, of course, into this. You can think of these documents as pointed in a high dimensional space. Now, of course, in this picture, the high dimension is two, but. And, and uh, all of these points, each of them are documents, and you are seeking what? You are seeking three points such that you can write all of them as convex combination of, of the three. Uh, extreme points, okay? And so this is an example in which, from another paper, in which we run an algorithm to do that. Okay. So one, one uh, in this whole area, there was a big you know, breakthrough or a, of a very influential paper uh, in, in the beginning of the 2000s by, by Bly, Ing, and Jordan in, in Berkeley. Uh, uh, Bly, uh, David Bly and Ring were student of Mike, students of Mike Jordan at the time. And, and what they introduced in the two papers, the, these papers are two, two ideas, two main ideas. Uh, the first idea is they came up with a nice Bayesian model for this, for this kind of process, uh, a nice generative model uh, uh, for this process that was based on, on a Dirichlet prior. I will not go into detail, but it had a lot of nice properties. And, uh, and second, Second, they came up with an algorithm that they call variational algorithm. And it's really a, mean field minim a, a free energy minimization algorithm that uses naive mean field. Well, this was uh, extremely impactful. Okay, so let me let me explain a little bit these two ingredients. Uh, the first ingredient is the Bayesian model. Again, I wrote this this model, which is, is WH plus Z. You can think that each entry xij is one row of this times one row of that. So a wi times hj, uh, hj plus some noise. And what does it mean, a Bayesian model? It means really that I have to give you a distribution for w, a distribution for h, and a distribution for the noise, or a conditional distribution for x given this product. Noise need, uh, doesn't need to be additive, really, right? Here I'm being a little bit. Uh, <laughs> quick, so it doesn't need to be edited. Well, I will not go into details, but basically the Dirichlet was the distribution here. Here, for instance, you need the distribution of a simplex, they used the Dirichlet distribution. Well, and there was some other bells and whistles, but uh, I will not go into describ describing it. And then what you do, well, you follow the, 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 the Bayesian approach. So you write the base formula. So you want to uh, infer H and W by computing the posterior of H and W given the observation X. You write the base formula, and this is the prior 
times the priority of x given w and h. And this they factorize. In their model, this distribution factorizes over the rows of, of w, and this factorizes over the row of h, and this factorizes over the entries of x i j. Okay? So all of these are factorized, and now you see that you, you get something really similar to statistical mechanics, because at the core, statistical mechanics is about high dimensional probability distribution that factorize into product of functions of a few terms each. And OK, what you want to compute, you want to compute marginals from this distribution. And what they do, they do naive mean field. And what does it mean? You know, one way to explain it, that that, uh, or the way they explain it is the following. I want to compute this distribution. So what I'll do, I'll take a trial distribution that is a factorized distribution. It's factorized over these rows of uh, wi and this, these rows of w's and these rows of h. I'll take you know, a factorized form. And then I'll try to find the mongol of this, the one that uh, minimizes the KL divergence, or basically you know, a, a good notion of distance from this distribution, and what you get is a free energy that depend on, depends on these QIs and Q tilde Js. Okay? And this is now it's tractable, and it's tractable, well, you know, the reason this is nice is that basically K, the number of topics, is fairly small, say 20, so these probability distributions are much simpler than a probability distribution over 100,000 objects. Okay, so, yeah. Yeah, so, so for, for each W, so each of these distributions are normalized. So the delta is inside Yeah, yeah, so, so this, uh, yeah, so that is easy. So Q tilde, I, Q tilde I of WI is a probability distribution over the simplex, and that's fine. Basically, you can deal with it, and, you know, the basic, the basic uh, you know, intuition is, of course, that uh, we can deal with probability distribution over 10 or 20 variables. OK, so, so good question. Now, this was extremely impactful, uh, et cetera. The qu good question, does it give you the correct answers? OK, so this is something at which we looked recently, and other people looked at recently. Surprisingly, it took some time. Yeah. With, uh, with, uh, and you, know, you would expect, not always, uh, being a physicist, in fact, this is what we find. We prove uh, the following, that you know, there is regions of these model parameters uh, in which naive main field gives you the wrong marginals. And gives you the wrong marginals in the following sense. You can construct uh, you know, parameters for which it's information theoretically impossible to distinguish the data from pure noise. There is no way to distinguish. Nobody can do it. No algorithm can do it. And yet, if you get uh, sort of naive mean field, you get some non trivial marginals. So, naive mean field is telling you there is some information in the data, but you know that there cannot be any information in the data. So, what naive mean field is telling you is basically rubbish. And of course, once you read this, you try, if you are in spin classics, you try to do tap correction. And we show that the same problem disappears with tap correction. Ideally, we would like to prove that tap free energy is correct, that is, gives you the right marginals for this model. The model is too complicated, and this is why we pass to a simpler model. And this is what I'll do. But this is one example of this trouble with, with the with this uh, approach with naive mean field. Here, you can, one thing that you can get out is not only the man marginals, but what uh, Bayesian statisticians call credible intervals. A credible interval is a nutshell, the Bayesian version of a confidence interval, so it should contain the truth with a pre-assigned level of confidence. For instance, you compute the credible intervals at 90% level, you want the credible intervals to cover the truth 90% of the time. And then you go in the bad region. This is a bunch of credible intervals. In this region, it works well. The, 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 the red ones are cases in which we didn't cover the truth. So here, perhaps, there is nearly 10% of mistakes. But here, there is much more than 10% of mistakes. There is 40%. Uh, and here, half of them are mistakes. Okay? So Bayesian method, in this case, gives you wrong confidence intervals, and the reason is basically that this mean field approximation is wrong. OK, so what, is, what are the main ingredients of this, of this model is, of course, there is a low rank structure, and there is noise. 
but the, the low rank uh, components have some, some additional structure, as some additional prior. Okay, so what is the simplest model that has these properties? Of course, it's a, it's a spin glass model. So we call this Z2 synchronization because it also appears in a different literature in signal processing, but it's the following. You have a vector sigma naught that is a plus minus one vector and it's unknown. And you observe sigma naught, sigma naught transpose times of coefficient plus noise. And noise is your nice GUE matrix. So these are like exactly the coupling constants of a Sherrington Kirkpatrick model, but with the bias towards uh, plus you know, this vector sigma zero. Okay? So you have a planted solution somehow that is points at sigma zero. If sigma zero was all plus one, this would be just the SK model with a non-zero ferromagnetic bias. Here is the SK model with a, uh, a gauge transform of that. Okay. And now you can set up all, all the you know, Bayesian uh, you know, kind of approach. You have a prior that is, say, the uniform prior where plus minus one to the n. So each bit is, is uniformly random. You compute the posterior, and it's very simple to see that is, of course, uh, the, the Boltzmann distribution uh, uh, with the SK Hamiltonian. And the temperature happens to be equal to lambda, and this is a generic property of this base model, and it's uh, what's known the, as the Nishimori line in physics. And what you would like to do to do estimation is, for instance, compute the posterior, so the expectation of sigma given j. Now, I brought this little parenthesis because this is strictly speaking zero, because the Hamiltonian is symmetric, you have to break the symmetry. I will not go into detail of how we break the symmetry, but okay. Uh, I can do it at the end of the talk if you're interested. Okay. So, so, so this model we studied and other people studied and uh, you know, all sorts of generalization of it. And so we know a lot of detailed things and we know it uh, you know, in a rigorous way. And uh, the, the executive summary is the following. <laughs> we can characterize exactly what is the base optimum error. And we, we can we have an algorithm that we can prove achieves this base optimal error. Okay? So we can compute this posterior expectation in efficiently, actually in linear time. Okay? So uh, this is uh, you know this fact formally stated. Uh, so this uh, okay, should uh, this uh, a result similar to this was proved by Corada and Macris, but was not really as an, viewed as an estimation problem and didn't contain a, a result on the error. So the error that you achieve is uh, uh, you know some formula that given by some kind of uh, replica symmetric formula. So the error, I measure the error here. I have a vector sigma naught that I want to estimate. I estimate it with sigma hat. I compute the cosine of the angle between these two vectors. So if the cosine is big, the error is small. Okay? So this is the accuracy is given by this gamma star that is a solution of a replica symmetric equation. And further, there exists an algorithm that, that achieves this efficiently. And, you know, Okay, so this is the simple model. The simple model, all sorts of generalization were studied, uh, in particular, for instance, by uh, Jean Barbier, Nicolas Macris, uh, Florent Lenka, uh, uh, Marc Lelage, Leo Miolan, and, and others, and, you know, and they generalized, they generalized in the sense of looking at higher rank, different distribution at sigma zero, uh, rectangular matrices, etc. And doing all of this generalization requires a bunch of you know, very interesting new ideas. This we did it with a very simple method. They came up with all sorts of great ideas to generalize this. Right. One thing that comes out of this is that if you look at this equation, this is a phase transition when gamma is equal to one. This gamma equal to one in the phase diagram of the SK model is the ferromagnetic phase transition. Okay, what is the algorithm? The algorithm is uh, uh, two step. First, you compute the eigenvector decomposition of the matrix. You take the principal leading eigenvector, you rescale it by a constant, and then you run a message passing algorithm. Uh, and uh, okay, this is a generic class of kind of message passing algorithm that is, we, we introduced a few years ago, and there's many sorts of versions, but in this case it's something very simple, it's just iterating the TAP equation. 
Right? So there is a general theory to, to, to analyze this type of algorithm that we developed uh, with, with Moss and Bayati using uh, you know, basically a technique by uh, Erwin Bolthausen. But, uh, but uh, okay, in this case, it requires some non-trivial generalization because of this initialization. The standard theory has an initialization that is independent of J. Uh, these dependencies come out, uh, you know, mathematically is a, is, a, is a bit tricky, so recently we generalized it to allow for this spectral initialization. And the spectral initialization is kind of needed because zero is a fixed point of this algorithm. Okay, so this is how it works in a small simulation. This is, as increased lambda, this is the scalar product. A lambda equal one, there is a phase transition. And, uh, you know, this is the prediction, the replica, this replica symmetric prediction. And uh, this is what principal component analysis gives you. And this dot is what this algorithm, two stages algorithm gives you. Okay, so, so even in this simple model, we know in the simple model, we know a lot, but even in the simple model, I wouldn't say that the situation is, is very satisfactory. And why it's not very satisfactory? Because I don't know what will happen if the model is incorrect. Is this all business uh, robust with respect to changes in the model? So if somebody comes and perturbs a little bit your metrics, will this algorithm still work, right? All of this, the algorithm was designed and the analysis was done on the assumption that the noise has high ID Entries and this will not be the case in any in any application whatsoever. Oh well, I don't know what this is. Hmm. Uh, one method to make this robust is, of course, to my, make variational. Huh? So to define an optimization function, an objective function that you minimize and gives you this estimate, and we know, of course, what is the right function. Okay. And uh, you know, hopefully the optimum of this function makes sense even if the model is completely wrong. Right, so this brings us to, to, to the free energy, right? So what does naive mean field gives in this case? Well, naive mean field in this case is very easy, of course, is mj m transpose jm plus the entropy term. Uh, and, and here it's very easy to explain the pathology that we found also in the topic model. It's, it's very easy. It's, it's, it's uh, you know, two lines, but I, I didn't know it before, so I'll explain it to you. Uh, M star equals zero is, is a stationary point, of course. If I look at this function, I take the gradient with respect to M, I get that M equals zero is a stationary point. And of course, this is a co what does it mean? What it corresponds is that the posterior distribution over the spins is uniform. So basically, this m star equals zero is telling you I cannot estimate the truth. This is a correct stationary point below the phase transition. For lambda less than one, we said we have no information. The data are pure noise. So this is the correct point for lambda less than one. So you check whether this is a local minimum. Uh, so we compute the Hessian. The Hessian is this one. And what you get is that the Hessian is one, ma the minimum eigenvalue of the Hessian is easy to compute is one, ma okay, this is identity and this is the semicircle between minus two and two for lambda less than one. So it's one minus two lambda for lambda less than one. Okay? So the, the minimum eigenvalue, this is one half. And then for lambda less than one. So the minimum again value in the lesson behaves like that as a function of one of uh, of lambda. Okay, so it becomes negative at one half. Okay, so this means that at one half, above one half, if you run naive mean field, if you minimize naive mean field, it, it tells you the magnetization is non-zero. So it's wrong. It's wrong because we know that below this is information theoretically impossible to, to get anything about the data. Okay, so of course we go to top free energy, okay, and this is the theorem that we prove. We prove that there exists a, a constant lambda zero, such that if lambda is lambda zero, the following happens with high probability. If you look below a level, a certain level, Okay, if you look beyond a certain level in energy, so this is the free energy, and this is M, zero. If you look below a certain level, 
uh, all the minimizer, look at all the critical points. So C is the set of critical points of this free energy. All the critical points of the free energy are very close to the Bayes optimum. I mean, to the posterior expectation, to the thermodynamic mean. So the free energy looks like this. There can be something like this and something like this. But if you go below this, it's very simple. There might be some local minima that here are bad. Possibly there are a few local minima here that are very close to each other. Mm. But if you go below this level, and this level is very easy to achieve. I mean, there are, we know that it's very easy to construct points that are, so it's not an empty theorem. If you don't, if you're low enough, the landscape is very easy. So this is M star, which is basically the thermal average, or write it like this. Okay. And of course, here there is always the symmetry breaking problem, but we deal with it. All right, so this is the content of the theorem. Ideally, one would like to get something uh, all the way to lambda 0 equal 0, uh, equal 1. That is, if you minimize the free energy, you get the, the, the correct uh, you know, marginal, but we cannot prove that. Okay? We expect something like this to be true all the way to lambda equal 1. But this is telling at least that in that regime, it's possible if you minimize the tap free energy, you get the correct marginal. So in other sense, words, it tells you that a tap free energy is a good variational principle. By the way, one interesting question, open problem, is whether there are other variational principles that are equally good, now, other free energies, because tap free energy has a lot of not nice properties. OK, so is the result clear? So complexity. The way we prove this is going through complexity. Okay. So let me state you the result about the complexity is the following. Uh, so look at. Uh, okay, there are four. If you if you ever if you were a cool kid in the you know ten years ago in Rome, you know this by heart. If you compute the complexity, you 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 need to look at these four quantities. One is the magnetization. The second is the overlap. The third is this uh, strange combination, and the fourth is the energy, the free energy. And then what you look is you look at the set of critical points uh, of the free energy. So the set of M on which the gradient is zero, and these four quantity belong to a set U. Okay? So if you fix a set U, think of it as a small cube in this four-dimensional space, and then you look for all critical points that have those four parameters inside that cube, call the number of those critical points crit of n, and what you would like to compute is compute this to the complexity is the exponential growth rate of this quantity, and this is what we get. We, we, we compute uh, 1 over n log expectation of crit. So log expectation of number of critical number that is the annealed computation. Okay, and uh, you know, we don't really compute this, we compute an upper bound on that. And uh, well, since the, you know, this is already an upper bound on the, on the real number of critical points, I don't think that you know, going to an upper bound is too much of a loss because okay, this upper bound is, is tight. Okay, so what is the shape of this formula? This formula is the infimum over uh, four Lagrange parameter of another formula, and this other formula is quite long. Okay, and if you, you know, and if you are Tommaso or uh, Luca Leuzzi or Giorgio, Mark, Irene, Andrea, you know it by heart. This is this formula. Okay, so couple of remarks. We proved this formula not just uh, the original motivation was to prove it on the Nishimori line that cor correspond to the base estimation problem. We prove it for any, for any beta in the whole plane. There is no, no real advantage to stick to the Nishimori line for this calculation. The formula is the same that appears in the physics literature. And there was you know, a bunch of, and it was first found out by, by Bray and Moore. And of course, this kind of calculation is something that was already uh, uh, done in other models. For instance, the p spin spherical model. This has been done in, in, uh, in great detail. But uh, I'll mention in a minute why this is more difficult. 
Okay, once you have the free energy, then once you have the complexity, you look at the region in which the complexity is positive, and if you plot it, this is a scheme, a, a, you know, a cartoon, you plot it as a function of magnetization and the free energy, you get that there is a blob where there is po this is positive, and this is a high energy and zero magnetization, and then you see that it touches exactly zero at two points. Huh? These are points in which if you look, if you plot the complexity, if you plot S as a function of the magnetization, you see like something like this. It touches exactly zero. So what this tells you mathematically is that outside the old, uh, in the old white region, there cannot be critical points. So all critical points are either very bad or this. And this, you find out that they coincide to the, with the thermodynamic quantities. Okay? So this tells you that all the critical points are either very ba bad or are the real marginal. And then you find out that the only ones b o lambda square over 3 are, are these two. And then you prove that they actually exist. You prove it algorithmically, for instance. OK, perhaps one word about how you do this calculation. The starting point is the cuts rise formula. Uh, so the expected number of critical points is an integral. There is this thing that is the density of the gradient as zero, and then there is the famous expectation of the absolute value of the determinant of the Hessian. And okay, if you ever saw this calculation, the, the tricky part is the expectation of the absolute value of the Hessian. And in the physics literature, there are all sorts of very uh, clever ideas to deal with that, fermions, uh, negative number of bosons, uh, all to exponentiate the determinant. Uh, a very nice, uh, beautiful trick is the, the, the trick of Fyodorov that relates it to a, a random matrix with one more, with more, one more uh, uh, dimension. But in this case, it doesn't work. Well, instead, we do something very simple. You want to compute the expectation of absolute value. Of course, that is equal to the expectation of the product of the eigenvalues. This is the sum of the log of the eigenvalues. And this you can write it as the integral over the spectral distribution of log of absolute value of x. And until here, I didn't do anything. Now I do something that you teach your incoming PhD student, you should never do, right? Push the expectation uh, upside eh, in the exponent. You, you should teach everybody this is wrong stuff to do. You go do big mistake, etc. And once you do this, well, you compute the expected distribution and you get a formula. And of course, the question is can you exchange expectation and the exponential? And can you compute this spectral distribution? Let's look at what is the Hessian. Well, the Hessian is J plus basically a low rank part that comes from here that is not really important. And then there is a diagonal part that is the derivative of uh, the Hessian the of this, which is diagonal. And notice that this is very different from what happens uh, on spherical p-spin. First of all, the Hessian depends on m. In the spherical p-spin, the Hessian only depends on q. And this is so much nicer. And second, this is a messier random matrix. In the, in the, in the, uh, the PSP model, that is just a GOE matrix plus the identity. Here is a GOE matrix plus a diagonal matrix. So that's pain. All right, so we have a GOE matrix plus a diagonal matrix. Let's neglect the low rank part. The first thing is that there exists something beautiful that is called the free probability that tells you that if you have two matrices that are free, I can compute their spectral distribution by summing the R transform. So this is the free convolution. And second thing, there is Gaussian concentration that tells you the probability that the spectral distribution deviates significantly from its expectation, goes down like e to the minus n squared. So this kills everything, right? So even if the fluctuation, the rare event, uh, you know, boosts up this expectation by this value by an exponential factor, the n square kills them. Okay? So these are two beautiful facts. And thanks to this, you write something like this at this point. And all sorts of other messy things, et, et cetera. Now, this is still tricky to tell the truth, right? Because now in the exponent, you have some function that depends on the free convolution of a Wigner law and this empirical distribution. And you have to integrate this over m. 
and a priori I wouldn't know how to do it, frankly. Mm? If, I see the, if you look at this formula, and you see this is expressed in terms of R transform, and if you know what R transforms are, are quite involved. Luckily, if you, if you look at the physics paper, you figure out that if everything in the physics paper are, is correct, this upper bound must be true. So you go ahead and prove that upper bound. And now this upper bound depends only on Q, and you know, it's, it's easy enough that you can integrate it over M. OK? So OK, I think this is a good motivation. Naive mean field is really a popular algorithm in machine learning. And I think uh, you know, can be improved using spin glass ideas. And you know, remarkably, uh, we ended up doing a complexity calculation that ends up being kind of amusing and non-trivial per se. Now, I'm not yet done because I asked uh, you to do this in turn. Did anybody figure it out? OK, it's 2 thirds. OK, and OK, now the, what is more interesting, OK, you can do it at home. What is more interesting is what is the connection? And the connection is through the, the, the person, the man who did this first. And this is the man in a painting that is seven kilometers from here. It's Archimedes. And Archimedes found this so beautiful, this result, that basically wrote a book on it that is called On the Method. And they find it beautiful because, because the result doesn't have pi in it. You know, if you compute stuff with cylinders and with, with uh, spheres, etc., you get all sorts of pi factors. Here, instead, he got a, a, a precise, a, a rational number. And he was very impressed by it. But the book, you know, and he explains this, but the book is called On the Method because uh, he explains it that what's most interesting is the way he found it. And he explains it that he found it by a method from physics. And uh, this is not fully rigorous, and eventually this needs to be proven geometrically. But having ideas from physics helps you doing this geometric calculation. And in page three or four of this book, there is this beautiful quote that I cannot help reading. I thought it was a good idea to present in the same book a special procedure to establish certain mathematical results by physics techniques. It is indeed easier to obtain a proof of what is sought once the guidelines have been determined by this method, rather than to seek one without any guidance. So I mean, all of this story with the replicas and, and the mathematics, etc., I think it's a beautiful story, but it's also a beautiful piece of a story that has been going on, going on for 23 centuries. Happy birthday. OK, thank you, Andrea, for, for your interesting talk. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Thank you for the very nice talk. Uh, uh, from a practical uh, viewpoint, uh, uh, for the topic modeling, one uh, of the problem is to make the choice of k of the number of topics. Uh, do you believe this approach can help to find a better way? Because uh, that part is still uh, somehow black magic. Uh, many times people try what they believe, uh, small numbers, uh, or depending on the computer resource, on the number of documents, uh, the choice uh, often is uh, quite that by chance. Do you yeah. believe this approach can help in uh, making that choice? I think it's a, it's a very difficult question, but uh, okay, one can try to aim for a simpler question. And the simpler question is the following. Assume that the model is correct, can you do it? Now, if you look at the literature, the statistics literature, there are methods to do this, and these are basically uh, minimizing the likelihood. If you minimize the likelihood, you always will find that you need infinitely many topics, right? So you put a penalty, and this penalty is, uh, for instance, the BIC or the AIC, ICAC information criteria. So if you look at this derivation of these penalties, these penalties are basically low temperature limits of the free energy. Okay? So now this is interesting, right? So for 50 years, uh, statisticians have been using a lot this IIC, which is low temperature approximation to this free energy. Hopefully, as physicists, we can find better approximation of this free energy, because low temperature is good for low dimensional problem. Temperature more or less is, physics temperature is related 
conceptually to the dimensionality of the problem. High dimensional problems require better uh, understanding of fluctuations and better understanding of finite temperature. So I think you know, real data is always a very tricky question, but uh, if you assume that the model is correct or it's near correct, then there is a chance to do better than what people are doing now. Okay, another. Uh, okay. Uh, can these uh, problems with the uh, naming field approach be resolved if the, this uh, kublock leblair divergence is replaced with some another distance measure? Uh, I don't see why, because really the problem with the naming field is that it's missing, uh, is neglecting some correlations that cannot be neglected. So it's really the ansatz that is wrong, it's not the, the distance that is wrong, right? I think, but I might be wrong. Okay, another question? Comments? Uh, we thank Andrea again for the seminar. Uh, we have the coffee break now, right now. Uh,